Right, good morning. The reading this morning will be from John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verily, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Thanks, Travis. So we are in a series looking at the parables of Jesus, and um, today we are looking at a parable where Jesus speaks about himself as being a seed, and he is the seed that has to die, goes into the ground, dies, so that others might live, other, other seeds might grow. And it's a, seed, it's a parable that's essentially about the, the death of Jesus. It's speaking about how if he didn't die, there wouldn't be life and salvation for others. And so that's at the heart of what Jesus is speaking about. And there are three contrasts in this passage of Scripture that I want to just highlight this morning. Jesus is highlighting, firstly, this contrast between the broadness of the gospel and the narrowness of the gospel. Secondly, that he is going to go to the cross and it's going to be about glory and about suffering. And then lastly, that uh, Jesus is a king who is a savior and an example to us. So, number one, this is a message that's broad and narrow. That's at the heart of what's going on in this passage. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but it's quite strange the way that Jesus responds Basically, what happens is uh, there are some Greeks who want to meet with Jesus, and they, they don't go directly to Jesus. They go to one of his disciples, and they say, we want to meet with Jesus. And when Jesus hears about them, Jesus says, my hour has come. So, so, so they go, we want to meet with Jesus. The, the, the disciples say to Jesus, there are some Greeks that want to meet with you, and Jesus goes, my hour has come, which is code for my time, the time for my death has arrived. Throughout the gospel so far, his hour has not arrived, and now finally his hour arrives. There is something about the Greeks that are wanting to see him that signals that his hour for his death has arrived. What is going on in this exchange over here? Well, essentially what's happening is that the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders have rejected Jesus. They have opposed him, they've rejected him, and their rejection has reached the height, it's reached the climax, and the, those who are not Jews, the Greeks, are now seeking after Jesus. He's rejected by the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, but he's accepted by the Greeks, and that signals to Jesus that the whole world is ready for the gospel. In fact, in verse 19, it says that the whole world has gone after him. That's what the religious leaders say. It's so funny how they're saying a whole bunch of things that are actually, they don't realize how true it is. The whole world is ready for him. Um, and, and Jesus realizes that the time has come for him to die because that is the only way for the whole world to be saved and rescued. He's not just the king for the Jews He's come in uh, on, a, on a donkey as a king for the Jews. They say, Hosanna to the king. But, but, but he's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the Greeks, and he's the king of the Indians, and he's the king of the Zimbabweans and the Zulus and the Dutch and the British also. He's the king of everyone. And, and, he, and it's only through his death that people are able to know him as king and to have a relationship with him. And so the fact that this broad message is now going to the Greeks signals to Jesus that it's time for his death. Christianity is broad. The gospel is broad because Jesus is not only the king of some provincial group of people, the Israelites. No, no. He's king of the entire world. That's why the Bible says that when God so loved the world, the whole world, that whoever believed in him could have eternal life. 
anybody. It's for anybody. It's for everybody. It's a message for the whole world. It's a broad message about His salvation that is for, for, for every single person in this room, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, the New Testament says, it's for all of us. And John, looking back, from, he has a vision about how it all ends, and he sees right to the end, every tribe and every tongue, every nation represented, people coming from all over because Jesus is the desire of the nations. Now, this is not just a sales pitch to people. You know, there are some things that people say, this, this is for everyone, like camping. Like some people say, you know, you've got friends who like camping and they want you to come camp with them. And then they'll say stuff like, you know, camping is for everyone. Really, it is. And then you're in your 20s and you don't really know what life is about. You don't know what you want out of life. So you agree to go along with your friends who are camping. And then you get there and it's storming and it's raining and there's lightning. And you're kind of praying in your little tent, two-man tent with your wife that the lightning wouldn't strike you, um, while your friends are in their three-story duplex suplex with a microwave and a fridge and a lightning pole set up, right? Camping is not for everyone. Camping is basically like, uh, my philosophy is like this, um, it's, it's like real life, but just a little bit harder. <laughs> there are loads of things that people say it's for everyone, you know, CrossFit is for everyone. No, it's not. It's not for everyone. Running is for everyone. It's really not. It's not. <laughs> Some of us are not made to run long distances. But you know how I know that the gospel is for everyone? Because 23 years ago, uh, Jesus saved a, a, a unchristian, unholy, rebellious 19-year-old that was on drugs and was the furthest thing from, from, from holy. And, and, and my life has never been the same since then. If he could do it in my life, he can do it in anybody's life. And so perhaps this morning, you're like the Greeks, and you're going, I want to know Jesus. I want to have a meeting with Jesus. The Greeks were living their best lives, really. They weren't part of the oppressed Jewish people. They had everything, every comfort that you could possibly think about, but it wasn't enough. And they realized that they needed something more. There was deeper questions. They had great philosophies. The, Greek had, the Greeks have had some of the greatest philosophers come from, the, from this particular time. But their philosophies were failing them. It wasn't really changing their lives. Perhaps you're in that place this morning where you want to, to, to know Jesus, where you come to Him. You can come to Him like the Greeks came to Him, like I came to Him, because the gospel is for all of us. It's for all people. So at, at one time, the gospel is broad, and yet at the same time, the gospel is narrow. Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's speaking about His death and His resurrection. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. What is that talking about? That's talking about how Jesus needs to die for you to be saved, for these Greeks to be saved, for, for, for our sins to be forgiven. And so there's a very narrow message over here, a message about a Savior, one person who died in your place for your sins to give you His righteousness so that the chasm between you and God, when you pray, you feel like you're not sure if He hears your prayers, that chasm, the chasm of sin can be dealt with and taken away so that you can be reconciled to the Father. That's a very exclusive message. It's a very narrow message. It's a message about one person who is perfect, who is unlike anybody else, Jesus, the one who is the God-man who has come to live the life that you and I failed to live, to die in our place on a cross so that we could know God afresh and we can have that reconciliation through faith. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's a narrow message. It's a message about an exclusive Savior. Only Jesus. There are not many ways to, Father, to the Father, to God. There's only one way. It's Jesus and His death. And it's through faith in His death that we have our sins forgiven. I wonder, perhaps, if today is the day of salvation for you. So, firstly, Good Friday is a message with, with broad acceptance. Anybody can belong, but it's also narrow. It's about, it's about one person, Jesus Christ and His death. Secondly, there's a cross about glory and suffering. Now, we get a glimpse over here of 
uh, both the glory of the cross and we get a glimpse about the suffering of the cross. Um, we get a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus. And it's so important for us to reflect on the humanity of Jesus, that this was hard for him. In our busy Joburg lifestyles, it's so easy for us to, you know, have just another Good Friday message or just another Good Friday service, just another Easter service without reflecting and pausing and looking unflinchingly at the pain and the suffering, at the cost of our salvation, at Jesus on the cross. Jesus says in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled. Now my soul is deeply perplexed. That's what the word means, deeply anxiety, there's deep anxiety. What shall I say? What shall I say? He was troubled like any human being, like anyone that faces their death and knows what is about to happen to them. He is deeply troubled. Now, I, I confess, I, I, don't, I don't like sad movies. I don't like sad songs. I don't listen to slow, slow jams. Um, you know, a part of it is because sadness makes me feel uncomfortable. And, and yet we are called over here to reflect on these words, Jesus saying, I am deeply, deeply troubled. This is perhaps the saddest event in all of human history. Jesus, the perfect one, rejected by those he has come to save and is in deep anguish and trouble. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's saying, should, should, should I pray to be saved from this hour, which he could have been? He could have called on a legion of angels in that moment to rescue him from the cross. And he says, no, for this very reason, I came to this hour. Part of the difficulty of what Jesus faced is the foreknowledge of his death. He was self-consciously going to the cross. He knew he was going to die, and he knew the type of death that he was going to die. He says that he is going to be lifted up. That's the type of death that he is going to die. Verse 32 says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. So, so the cross was about being, being nailed and then being hoisted up in front of everyone so everybody could see you. It was, it was the Romans making, making an example of criminals. And so Jesus says, I know the type of death I'm going to die. He, he knows that he's going to be lifted up on a cross. He knows that his hands are going to get nailed. It's a common way of dying. He knew that this was the way that they were going to choose for him to die. He knew that, 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 that the, the cross was designed to, to hit your median nerve that runs from your hands through your forearms, into your biceps, into your shoulders. He knew that as he hung there, it, it would be a matter of time before he would have to put his weight on his feet, which was nailed into the cross. But then the same thing would happen. He knew that his blood would slowly congeal as he struggled to get enough oxygen into his system. He knew that every time his weight shifted from his hands to his feet, he would open up the lacerations on his back and further impale himself. He, he, he could see every single detail of what lay before him. And he says, what shall I say? Should I pray to be saved from this hour? No. No. It is for this very reason that I came. There's something about like good horror movies. I, I don't really like horror movies, but there's something about good horror movies where the victim knows what's going to happen to them, right? They're trapped in a dungeon somewhere, and they know exactly what's going to happen to them. That's the scary bit. Like they can hear something happening, and they, there's no way out. See, Jesus knows exactly what's about to happen to him, and it's horrific. And, and, and this is his Gethsemane moment where he prays, you know, should I, should, should I, should I be saved? Should I be rescued? No. I'm, I'm going to face the cross. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. It's excruciating for him. The word excruciating actually comes from the word cross. At the, at the word crux is in the word excruciating. It's about, it's about, it's about being in, in pain like Jesus was on the cross. Perhaps you've been through something excruciating. Jesus is about to go through something excruciating, and he faces it head on. He, he, he musters up all of his courage, and he says, I did not come into this world to judge the world, but to save the world. There are many people that die excruciating deaths, and sometimes people die really well. There's some heroic deaths out there. I love the movie Gladiator and Braveheart, and uh, these movies where, where people die well. 
There's loads of people who die well. But Jesus' death is, is, is different. His pain is not only about the suffering, the physical suffering that he faced. It's about what happened to him on the cross. On the cross, the Father turns his face away as the sin of humanity is poured out on Jesus. Paul puts it this way. Paul says, he became sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He became sin who knew no sin, so that in him you and I might become the righteousness of God. All the failures, all the sin, all the missing of marks in my life and in your life gets poured onto Jesus, and he faces the consequences that should have been mine. He takes my place, your place on the cross, and he dies. This is why the cross is so important. It's one thing to know the story. It's another thing to, to in your heart, in, in, inside of your heart, know why he did this for you. He did this for me. He did this because there's no other way for you to be saved, no other way for our sins to be atoned for. He did this so that you would know his forgiveness. And Jesus says, this is the very reason that I came to go to the cross, to die in your place for your sins, ultimate suffering, but also ultimate glory. He says in verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, often we think about the glorification of Jesus in the Easter story about him being raised from the dead. Nick is going to preach on this on, on Sunday. And, and this is a glorious moment. This is a moment of vindication. But but he's talking about being glorified in the cross over here. That's what verse 23 is talking about. The cross itself is a glorious thing. How is the cross glorious? The cross is glorious in many ways, but here's perhaps the most obvious way. The cross is the most altruistic demonstration of love. The most, the most pure moment of somebody doing something for, for people that they don't fully deserve, and, and, and that Jesus doesn't get anything else out of. So often we do things that are altruistic, but, but we get some sort of payoff out of it. But this is Jesus giving up his life for no other reason than to see you saved, to see me rescued. It is, it is the definition of love. If you're looking for love, if you're looking to understand it, don't, don't listen to the love songs. If you're looking to understand love, don't, don't turn to romance. If your heart craves for love, Look no further than the cross, because this is, this is love defined. No greater love has a person than to lay down his life for a friend. And this is exactly what Jesus has done on the cross. And time and time again, I'm brought back to the cross. And I don't know what your life is like, but there are moments in my life where I, I struggle to make sense of life, where, where suffering happens, where you lose a loved one, where, where, where you go through something that's really difficult, and you, and you struggle to make sense of life. And I'm brought back to the cross. Because while I don't understand everything about God, while you might not fully understand everything about life, when you look to the cross, you are reminded that God loves you. And that if He has gone to the great lengths that He's gone to give up His own Son for you, there is nothing that He wouldn't do for you. He cares for you. So, thirdly, there is a King who is both a Savior and an example. Verse 25 is deliberately vague. It's ambiguous. It, it, you're not sure if verse 25 is about Jesus or if it's about us. Let me read it to you. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So on one level, this verse is about Jesus Jesus is the one who, who, who didn't love his life and who actually self-sacrificed himself. And, and he gave his life for others so, so, that, so that we would, might, would be served, so that we would be saved, and the Father honors Jesus. So on one level, that's what it's about, but it's deliberately ambiguous. It's, a, it's, it's meant for us to go, to look at the cross and to go, thank you, Jesus. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I'm going to follow your, your, your self-sacrifice. I, I want to do that too. On another level, it's about anyone who loves their life too much in this world. In this world, it's comparative, right? Who, who, who wants to live their best life now. 
It's about anyone who's in that position and says, I, I want to give it up for Jesus. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it to eternal life. I think that's a good deal. Temporary life versus eternal life. Jesus says you get eternal life if you, if you love me, if you serve me. And then it goes on and it says, my father will honor the one who serves me. My father will honor the one who serves me. I love that. We sing about us honoring God often. But, but Jesus says, if you will give up your life, if you will in this world prioritize him, if you will in this life sacrifice yourself for him, then the Father will honor you. The Father himself will honor you. Many of you, even right now, are experiencing this death, the self-sacrifice in your own lives in different ways. Things that you are dying to. Things that you are suffering. And you could alleviate your own suffering right now. You could alleviate it by compromising on your faith. You could do that. But you have chosen to follow Jesus. And today is a reminder that on the other side of the cross is a crown. On the other side of suffering is the Father saying, I honor you. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's mind-blowing that God would do that for you, for me, for all those who would choose to follow Jesus. And I love the hymn. It puts it this way. Oh, the wonderful cross bids me come and die. And find that I may truly live. I wonder what areas God is calling you to sacrifice. In what areas God's calling you to say, come and die so that you might truly live. Where is God calling you to, like Jesus, follow his example of self-sacrifice? Sometimes it might be in the realm of finance or in work or relationships. But in different ways, the Savior calls us to follow him. So that where he is, we too may be.